right, everybody, we're going to talk now uh, about a few more clotting disorders as we talk um, primarily here about factors. Now, I did a whole nother talk on uh, the hemophilias. Those are higher yield. Uh, however, some of these things that we're going to talk about here are also pretty high yield. Um, so they're not hemophilias, but they can cause factor type bleeding. Um, usually not as severe, but they can cause it uh, in patients who do not have hemophilia. So these are more acquired causes, if you will. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated and definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications every time I put a new video up. All right, so we're going to talk about vitamin K deficiency. We'll talk about factor deficiency, secondary to liver disease. Remember, two, five, seven, and 10 are made in the liver. And the vitamin K dependent uh, factors are two, seven, nine, and 10. That should be burned into your brain from uh, step one. We'll talk about DIC, very important. Uh, concept for you to know, diagnosis, because it comes up frequently. And then we'll talk about a couple drugs just so you understand how they work, because that could get tested as well. All right, vitamin K deficiency is exactly what it sounds like. Usually it's due to malnutrition or malabsorption. So think of maybe babies who don't get their vitamin K shots at birth, home births, for instance. Um, think of people with malabsorptive syndrome, celiac disease, uh, inflammatory bowel. Um, this is primarily absorbed in the terminal ileum. And as we know with Crohn's disease, you can get ileitis. So that could be a problem. Uh, think also about possibly patients who are on antibiotics. Vitamin K absorption is assisted by normal flora. So if we have any kind of disturbance there, we could get a vitamin K deficiency as well. Uh, risk factors, premature birth, IBD, celiac, and malnutrition, like I said. Uh, the symptoms, you'd have factor-type bleeding, similar to hemophilia, um, but you can also have some superficial bleeding as well, similar to hemophilia. Uh, diagnosis here. So you'll want to get your routine labs, coagulation studies, factor assays, so get a CBC, PT, PTT, a uh, mixing study because we want to differentiate this from hemophilia. A lot of these patients are really young, factor 8 and factor 9 level, and a vitamin K level. Okay, that is the most accurate, as I'm sure you can understand why. Um, so on CBC, you may see an iron deficiency anemia because of bleeding, PT, PTT. You'll see a prolonged PT, but not so much PTT. And the reason for that is because factor seven has the shortest half-life. And uh, because factor seven is involved with vitamin K, that's going to drop and it would be the first to drop. So we would expect to see the PT drop before the PTT. However, in severe vitamin K deficiency, um, because it does affect the other factors, you can get a prolonged PTT as well. If we do a mixing study, it will correct because we do have activated uh, factor that we're adding to it. So it'll correct similar to hemophilia. Factor eight level will be normal. Remember, that's not vitamin K dependent. Factor nine level will be low. That is vitamin K dependent. Remember, two, seven, nine, and 10. And then the vitamin K level, which is the most accurate, uh, will be low. Um, and there is technically another test that is more uh, accurate and specific, uh, but you can't order it on CCS, so I would not worry about it. Uh, the treatment here, if it's just mild to moderate bleeding, just replace the vitamin K. If it's severe bleeding, internal bleeding, uh, you want to add fresh frozen plasma onto the oral vitamin K. Remember that we need to give IV vitamin K if we're talking about a patient with malabsorption because giving, or, you know, they're getting vitamin K in their diet, they're just not absorbing it. So giving them a pill is not going to help. Um, we do not give vitamin K intramuscularly to patients who are deficient because we do not want to precipitate a muscular hematoma. So we talk oral or IV, um, and then just remember it's IV if they have, if we suspect a malnutrition or malabsorption rather. These are foods that are rich in vitamin K. And as you can see, it's a lot of vegetables and leafy greens. Okay, factor deficiency secondary to liver disease. Remember here, we're talking about two, five, seven, and 10. 
Um, this is uh, most associated with GI bleeding, especially varices. And the reason, as I'm sure you can imagine, is that varices are just in general associated with cirrhosis. And most of these patients do indeed have cirrhosis. Um, so what you'll see is you get your labs, get a CBC, BMP, LFT, and PTPTT, basic labs to get in a patient who's you know got liver disease and happens to be bleeding too. Uh, you may see, again, an anemia. Um, you may see low platelets. Remember, thrombopoietin is made in the liver. So if you have liver disease, you may have low thrombopoietin. And secondary to that, you would have a low platelet count. BMP is usually normal. LFT will invariably show elevated transaminases, uh, the picture of liver disease. And then PT, PTT, uh, you'll see a prolonged PT and the PTT will be normal or prolonged. Uh, and it's exactly the same reason uh, with the vitamin K difference. Efficiency. Factor 7 has the shortest half-life, so when these start to decline, we're going to see factor 7 drop first, and that's going to cause the prolonged PT. Uh, the treatment here is uh, depends on the type of bleeding. If they're having variceal bleeding, we need to address that first, EGD and banding. Um, however, the best medical therapy is 4-FPCC. That is uh, four-factor prothrombin uh, complex concentrate. Um, so I would commit that to memory. Long-term therapy is based on the type of liver disease. Often this is non-reversible because it's associated with cirrhosis. You need a liver transplant. Uh, this is just a picture here of some of the things that we are talking about. I found this. This is kind of nice, so you can print this out if you want. Okay, DIC, we're probably all familiar with this one. This is widespread clot formation and exhaustion of factors. So basically, we're just using everything up. Platelets, factor, everything. Okay, this results in disseminated clots, which can cause a thrombosis, uh, which can result in organ damage. Uh, because we're using up uh, all of our factor and we're using up platelets, you can get pretty significant bleeding as well. There are a lot of things that cause this, um, so we need to figure out the underlying cause. DIC is a problem, uh, but there's an underlying cause in most situations, and we need to figure out what that is. How does this present? Well, you can have platelet or factor type bleeding. And so petechiae and purpura are very common as well. Um, signs of the underlying cause may be present. I mean, if it's a septic patient, and a lot of them are, uh, that's gonna be pretty apparent. Hypotension, tachycardia, pallor, so forth. Oozing from the IV site is very commonly put onto vignettes, so I would remember that. Purpura fulminans and acrocyanosis, I've got pictures of these. So this is purpura fulminans right here, and acrocyanosis. These are various causes of DIC. Sepsis is a big one. Another one that you should know is malignancy, particularly here the most commonly tested is uh, acute promyelocytic leukemia or M3 AML. There's a couple OB causes um, and then uh, snake bites. I don't think you'll get tested on that. All right, diagnosis here. So really this is gonna look like a platelet deficiency and a factor deficiency and all your factors are used up. So we're gonna have thrombocytopenia. You'll see schistocytes. Why? Because you've got, you've got clotting. Uh, and those clots are going to cause uh, uh, shearing of the red blood cells. Uh, BMP will be variable, just depends on the etiology. Both PT and PTT will be prolonged. The D-dimer will be elevated and fibrinogen will be low. We're just using everything up here. Major differential is ITP and TTPHUS. So ITP is a quantitative platelet problem. There are no issues with factors, so PT and PTT will be normal. Um, it's going to be thrombocytopenia only. It also typically doesn't present with really severe symptoms, not like DIC. TTPHUS is also a quantitative platelet problem. There's some hemolytic anemia added on to that. Um, so again here, you're going to have a normal PT and PTT, but look for those schistocytes. We do see that in DIC as well. DIC, um, which we talked about, is a platelet and a factor problem. That's what really causes this one to stand out. 
Treatment here stabilizes and manages the underlying cause. Further treatment um, just depends on if they have active bleeding or not. So if their platelets drop below 10,000, we will transfuse them with platelets to, to slow the bleeding. But in general, um, we try to avoid giving platelets and just kind of observe them. Um, fresh frozen plasma can certainly be given as well. That will replace factor. Okay, so onto these drugs. So heparin and low molecular weight heparin are commonly given as prophylaxis or for treatment for uh, vascular episodes. Um, the mechanism of heparin and the low molecular weight heparins is to activate antithrombin 3, which has an anticoagulant effect. Um, and then the result of this would be prolongation of both PT and PTT. Uh, but when we monitor response to heparin therapy, we monitor the PTT. Unlike warfarin, where we measure the PT, we monitor with PT. Okay, so this is just a uh, little map here. Um, heparin, what it does is it activates antithrombin, which then inhibits thrombin as well as factor 10. The major adverse effect of heparin therapy is HIT, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. This is basically an allergic reaction. You start attacking your platelets, but as you do so, you activate the platelets, and so you will have uh, a thrombocytopenia with a thrombosis. So that is the major manifestation. If you have a thrombosis with a low platelet in a patient who just started heparin, it's very obvious what you're dealing with. Uh, platelet factor four antibodies is technically the best initial test, but you're likely going to be doing other tests to figure out what this is. Um, so I would call this more of a confirmatory test. The treatment is to switch to Fondaparinux, which doesn't have, um, is much less likely to have a reaction like this. A uh, heparin overdose, I'm just putting this in here, is treated with protamine sulfate. Warfarin is basically a vitamin K inhibitor, if you will. Um, so it's used in a similar context. The nice thing about warfarin is that it's oral. So we put a lot of patients on this for their anticoagulative needs, but uh, there are uh, new drugs that are coming out now that are better because we don't have to monitor the patients all the time. Um, the mechanism of action here is to inhibit factors that are dependent on vitamin K. So vitamin K uh, is a cofactor for an enzyme that carboxylates these factors. And so if we can block that, we can't activate the factors, and so they're useless. Uh, remember, though, that warfarin also, uh, or the, uh, so warfarin also inhibits protein C and protein S. Okay, and these have the, uh, a very short half-life, even shorter than, than factor seven. And so initially when we start warfarin, we're actually going to be in a procoagulative state because remember that protein C and protein S are anticoagulative. Um, so this can cause an adverse effect. And that adverse effect is, um, do I talk about it? Yes, so that adverse effect is warfarin-induced skin necrosis, exactly for the mechanism that I mentioned. Uh, you can treat this by administering fresh frozen plasma, which does contain protein C. So we're giving those factors, but it'll have protein C, and that's really what we're getting at, I think. Okay, and then the last thing I wanna mention with warfarin here is that we monitor PT during therapy. This is the mnemonic I used in med school. Okay, so warfarin overdose and toxicity, not super common. Usually this is intentional or it's a kid that gets into it. Look for uh, bleeding. Um, the diagnosis uh, is typically made by PT. You'll have super therapeutic levels. Uh, I will mention that some older people, they lose track of when they're supposed to take their medication. Maybe they are taking too much, and um, so it can happen there too. Uh, the treatment here is to replace uh, with 4-FPPC or fresh frozen plasma. Give vitamin K via IV because it's important we get that in them right away, and then tranexamic acid may be used as well. And this is just a recap of everything we talked about.